Um, I'm going to talk, I, just before the break, there was a question about uh, law enforcement and what are we doing about it, international cooperation. Well, here we are. Uh, EC3, European Cybercrime Center, established as in particular to improve the cooperation at EU level in the combating of, uh, of cybercrime. But then in relation to the citizen and small businesses. And there it's, it was actually difficult for me to find something concrete. But uh, we'll get to that. EC3, European Cybercrime Center, was created within the framework of Europol for good reasons. Uh, I think one of the most important ones is that uh, Europol is an organization with a very strict legal framework and a highly regulated data protection framework, heavily supervised, and that is, of course, a key condition for processing personal data at EU level. If we were supposed to create a European Cybercrime Center and we would have to wait for legislation, a legal basis for that processing, it would have taken at least another three, four years. But then we also have to understand the framework of Europol. Europol is there, focused on serious organized crime and terrorism to assist the member states in their investigations. We are not a European FBI. We don't have coercive measures. We don't do our own investigations. Instead, we bring intelligence together from the member states and help them in their investigations and in their cooperation also with partners abroad. Also in ter terms of governance, we're fully embedded within the structure of Europol and report to the director of Europol and through that to the European administration. And when it comes to activities also there, our focus is in particular on uh, supporting the member states in their investigations and not so much to interact with the citizen. And why is that? At the EU level, uh, we have agreed that when it comes to uh, specific crimes, the reporting has to be done at national level. There is the authority to decide whether or not to do something with it and to take it to court. There is not a European court where we can go with crimes uh, and uh, have it done at EU level. So that's why all the crimes need to be reported at national level. And therefore, we also never had any interaction with the citizen or with businesses. We de dealt with law enforcement organizations in the EU traditionally. And so when it came to cybercrime, we of course had a major challenge. Because in the traditional forms of crimes, we are the police. The private sector, we have a warrant, you need to provide me this and that. And now in the area of cybercrime, we are fully dependent on the cooperation with the private sector. They have the information that is needed. They have the expertise that is needed to combat this successfully. And therefore, we had to have a different approach in the area of cybercrime. And that was a very interesting challenge, and we're very happy with that. And so far, it's going pretty good. Then, also, um, being part of, of Europol means that we're part of the, the EU policy cycle. And that is something new. It started a few years ago, where we have decided that we're going to align our priorities at EU level when it comes to law enforcement cooperation, which is very, very welcome. So what happens now in the EU policy cycle? Every four years, there's a threat assessment made by Europol. And this threat assessment is used to identify priorities for the next four years. For each of the priorities of which cybercrime is one of them, we identify strategic goals of what we want to achieve in four years. And every year we then decide what concretely we are going to do, together with the member states, to, to make that happen. Operational action plans to make sure our efforts are well concerted, coordinated and targeted on the key risk and the three key threats to the citizen and businesses. So there's a very good development. Uh, Cybercrime is, is one of those areas, and we have identified also three sub-areas that each will be dealt with uh, together with the member states to have the right uh, focus. Now here are a number of things. We do many things in the area of, of cybercrime. We already had quite a bit of experience when it comes to 
cooperating with the member states in their investigations in the area of cybercrime. But with the new European Cybercrime Center, we got a couple of things on top of that. And that applies in particularly when it comes to things that are better done at EU level jointly than individually. For instance, when it comes to co coordination of training, when it comes to specific investments in research and development. And also the link with the private sector is one of the key things where we can be very helpful to the member states. It is very difficult to get a good picture of who's doing what in law enforcement in the member states. Every member state has their own organizations, their own structures, sometimes competition between police forces, and it's very difficult for the private sector to know exactly whom to contact in which country. And vice versa, there are so many companies that we have to work with whether this is the IV and antivirus industry, whether this is uh, the financial sector, whether this is, these are internet service providers. Also for the law enforcement to know all of those and to have the right context, it's better to have an entity in between that provides that service. And for us, key, international part, international cooperation. And we have had a long tradition of cooperating uh, not just with member states but also with a predominantly Western group of uh, international law enforcement partners. But when it comes to cybercrime, we have a number of others that we have to work with and can work with, can benefit from their activities by aligning those. One of them is INISA. Uh, Steve will speak later on that. CEPOL when it comes to uh, training and capacity building and you are just for uh, judicial coordination of international investigations. But in the area of cybercrime, there's also other partners that we now can work with, because the threat is not just within the EU, it can come from everywhere. It can come from, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, from South America. Partners with whom we don't have the legal instruments to cooperate with effectively. And therefore, we're very happy that we have, especially in the area of cybercrime, a very good cooperation with Interpol that can make this link to those partners. And the fact that we have limitations in what we can do in terms of exchange of personal data, judicial cooperation with those countries, we do have the possibility to support them in the area of capacity building, for instance, and use the training material that we're building here in the EU and make it available to other countries, like India, like, like Colombia, etc. So there's a strong possibility and need to cooperate beyond our traditional ways of working. But then, the private sector. Especially the private sector is um, <clears throat> an area, a, a very broad area of, of partners with whom we have to interact in a different way than in the past at a level of, of openness and a level of uh, equality that is needed to make sure as, as equal partners to really cooperate. And not just that we get information from them, but also that we align our activities. I mean, there are private institutes that take down botnets. In the past, that you would have considered that as police work, but here, all of a sudden, there are... Uh, enterprise which are so powerful and so dominant that they can take over certain roles that traditionally would be allocated to law enforcement. Then of course also academia research centers and the CERTs, the computer emergency response teams in the member states. And last but not least, and here we get a little bit closer to also the individual, the citizen, with uh, a number of NGOs. The crime areas that we are focusing on, and these are the priorities for the coming four years, are uh, crimes committed by serious organized criminal gangs that make huge profits, for instance, by, by card fraud. Um, in addition, child sexual exploitation is one of the areas that we focus on. And the third one is uh, basically the, the traditional form of cybercrime, malware, intrusion, hacking, and those types. 
When it comes to cyber attacks, the problem that we're facing now is that it's so easy to commit crimes. For two dollars, you can take down the website of your competitor for an hour. So that is for 24 hours, that is 48 dollars. So if you have a bit of a competition issue, then you can just take their website down. Very easy. I mean, if you want to buy something on the internet and you're a bit short of money, and you want to buy something big, like big television, you can easily procure some credit card details, perhaps the ones that were recently stolen here in Ireland, and use them to make those procurements. Very easy, not expensive. Actually, you don't need any technical expertise to commit cybercrime. All the services are hosted. Criminals are offering you services that make it very easy to commit cybercrimes. And this is one of the key things we believe that we should be targeting in the coming years. Ransomware. The possibility of criminals to block your computer. And then they ask you for, for, for money in exchange for giving you access back again. Well, this is one of the few examples where we do have an interaction with a with with, with citizen. Because these criminals sometimes use a police logo. And they say the police has seen that you have visited illegal websites and therefore you now have to pay a fine. And they also use our logo. And then the complaint letter from the citizen ends on my desk saying that who I, I think I am to access uh, their internet traffic and to, to, to monitor them. Well, we don't do that. We then have to explain we don't do that. Yes, you have no right, and I perhaps visited one porn site, but that was adult, and it's none of your business. So, also there we have sometimes the interaction directly with the citizen. Payment fraud. The skimming of your, of your cards we deal with, but also, and that is even bigger now than the skimming of cards, it's, uh, I think, 60% of all uh, abuse of, of credit card details is already online. It's by data breaches, getting access to these data and, and uh, selling them on the internet or using them for, for direct procurements. And a very big problem here is the underground economy, where basically you can... Also, buy drugs online, buy weapons, even have somebody murdered. You can order all of those services online. Uh, very easy for, for the citizen, but uh, as a victim, it is, of course, terrible that this is so easy. And one of the reasons it's so easy is that there's the anonymity of financial transactions, the anonymity to actually commit these crimes and... Uh, the, the lack of traceability for us to actually find the perpetrators. And that applies in particularly when it comes to child sexual exploitation. The possibility to have anonymous traffic on the internet uh, makes it very difficult for us to combat these crimes and very easy for the criminals to commit these crimes and get away with it. So what can we do with it? And especially looking at the cooperation with the citizen. Well, I think, I believe there are 2.9 million police officers in the EU. But if you go to them and say, listen, my, my Facebook account was hacked, I think 99% of you, of them, will, will just stare at you. At best, express their uh, sympathy. But there's nobody really who, who can, can, can process that. What are we going to do about that? I think when it comes to reporting, it, it needs to be possible for the citizen to report the crimes. Otherwise, we don't know what the, the, the challenge is we're facing. I think we know at best 5% of the crimes that are committed. Why? Because nobody's reporting them. Businesses are not reporting them because of uh, reputational damage. And citizens are not reporting because they don't expect anything to happen with it. And the victims of credit card fraud will usually get it refunded by the credit card company. So why report that? But for the police, it means that we don't know 
where the priorities are. We don't really see that. And that's where we need heavily the involvement also of the private sector who do have a certain view on what is going on, who do can share <coughs> the, the threats uh, that, that are facing them. And especially when it comes to, for instance, a certain kind of, of, of attack on the financial sector, if that data can be used to inform other banks so that they can protect themselves, I believe there is an opportunity to better protect. But what are we, are, are we forgetting here? We are forgetting our children. Are we actually investing enough time to make sure they are, can operate on the internet in a secure manner? I don't think so. At least I have three children at school. They learn how to, oper how to, how to uh, act in traffic, how to cycle and, and how to cross the street. They even learn how to swim. But they don't learn how to operate on the internet. And first and foremost, it's also a responsibility for the parent. The problem of the parent nowadays is that they don't have any authority in this respect. I'm eyeless. I don't have an iPod. I don't have an iPhone. I don't have an iBook. And at home I have an iStore because my children and my wife love iProduct. And therefore when I try to convince them that they should do, be doing this or that, they completely laugh at me. Listen, that's not the way it works. So how can a parent or a teacher convince their children, the children how to operate if they don't have the authority, if they don't have the knowledge to actually convince them how they should operate? So that is, I think, a challenge. And I think education is one of the areas where we should really focus on. And making sure there is the link, and that is something that we should be looking at ourselves, there is the link between what is seen, what the threats are, and what the citizen, the small businesses know and can take into account when protecting themselves. And that will still always continue to be a challenge. But it is so easy now to commit these crimes that the trick here should be that there's, when it comes to organized criminals and the really professional ones, the leaders in there, they're miles ahead. They're sometimes one or two years ahead of all the followers that uh, take over their, their experience and their tools and apply them. And against the leaders in organized crime, it's very difficult to protect yourselves. They're always ahead of the game. But for the followers, I'm convinced that we can close the gap and reduce the time between what is newly developed by the leaders and the time they get to actually implement that and apply that in a much broader sense if we can close that gap by better sharing that information and in an earlier stage enable citizens, businesses and governments to protect themselves against it, we have a chance of reducing this. Thank you very much for your attention.